pretty hi hi. Uh, a, a bit of a shift now in focus. Um, James Driver will be doing um, a presentation on video gaming gambling, some of the intersections, and um, it sounds like it might bring some first-hand experience to to the subject. And um, James is the um, founder of Net Addiction New Zealand, so I'll be very interested to hear. All right. Um, yeah, welcome everybody, and thanks for the invitation to come along and uh, talk today. I'm really grateful to uh, have been able to hear um, Professor Gerda's talk this morning because I think it really gives a lot of the context for some of the stuff I want to talk about. Oh, you can't hear me very well. Okay, um, which is around what's becoming a sort of a convergence between video game economics and gambling. So just to briefly give an introduction to myself, I'm currently completing a master's dissertation into the experiences of people who have received treatment for gaming addiction. I'm the founder of uh, Need Addiction New Zealand, which is a resource site for people who are interested in video gaming addiction specifically. And I'm a psychotherapist in private practice, and my sort of background is working um, in alcohol and drugs. However, before all of this, I was Benway Monochrome, a level 60 bard on the, Ever uh, the computer game EverQuest. I, um, I had an epic weapon and had killed a whole lot of internet dragons. I was a member of one of the most accomplished guilds on the server, and by the time I finished playing, I'd played for over 2,000 hours just on that character and a whole lot more on many others. And at the worst point for me, I was playing around 16 hours a day, and that lasted for at least a couple of years. And I eventually sold my character on eBay for 300 US dollars, which I worked out, uh, came out to about 15 cents an hour. Uh, that's if I don't take into account the sort of several tens of thousand dollars I wasted um, going to university in a course I failed out of, and all the takeaways I bought mostly from the Fusan Tea House, which I can highly recommend. So this is a large part of the reason for my interest in this topic. I had first-hand experience with problematic video gaming, and I've been really interested in some of the economic developments behind video gaming, which are now, I think, converging in a number of areas with gambling, which is why I'm here today. Um, I'm not very good at short presentations, so I made a long presentation and figured I'd talk faster, so I hope you'll just bear with me as I do a bit of a whirlwind tour through a fairly complex topic. Oh, and that's just, for those of you who haven't done much of this kind of thing, this is what I spent 16 hours a day staring at. So in today's talk, I just want to outline my hypothesis and give a few examples, talk about some of the problem video gaming statistics from around the world. Oh, and before I go on, when I'm using the term gaming here, I'm talking about computer gaming, not gambling. I understand that uh, that term's been sort of used increasingly by the gambling industry, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, they can bugger off and find a new one because we've been using that term in gaming for a hell of a long time, and I don't think we're going to come up with anything different. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the different levels of uh, video gaming from high engagement all the way through to sort of quite addictive gaming. And then I'm going to talk a bit about coercive monetization and the link to gambling, which is kind of the core of this. Um, I'll use that term a bit, so just to very briefly describe it, coercive monetization, I'm referring to um, tactics used by the game manufacturers to essentially uh, rely on psychological tricks to convince the players to spend money. So it's, um, yeah, that's the coercive element to it. I'll come back to that. Uh, so my core hypothesis is this. Uh, as we're all aware, there's an increased availability of video gaming devices. You can play games on your mobile phones these days, which, as we've seen, pretty much everybody has. And there's a huge social acceptance of gaming. It's a big part of our culture now. Um, the gaming industry makes more money than the rest of um, media combined in New Zealand. The economic model of games has changed, and particularly in mobile games, and has shifted towards uh, these in-app purchases and coercive monetization through the use of free-to-play, or, or what Professor Goethe called freemium games. And the combination of these two factors means that I think we're going to see not only increases in video gaming addiction, but uh, that video game addicts are going to start experiencing similar symptoms and um, be subject to some of the same psychological tricks as what have been used in gambling games. Um, I'll just skip that quote to somebody who's got more experience saying much the same thing. Um, so just as an example, you know, one of the, this is one of sort of a number. This is a Chinese official recently um, was prosecuted and for embezzling 424,000 US dollars in public funds for a video game addiction. And this is not even gambling. There's no financial reward for him out of this. It's just the game itself is that compelling. Um, most of you will probably be familiar with this term, but it's become quite widely used in sort of game economic circles. 
uh, this idea of whale, it's somebody who spends exorbitantly or recklessly in these free-to-play or freemium games. And uh, this is just a quote from one of the CEO of these companies. So it's a very small minority of players um, who are often accounting for a large amount of the revenue in these games. And I really want to emphasize that because this is true when it comes to problematic video gaming as well. Like a lot of people do use these games in a pretty normal kind of way, but there are a minority of players that's still significant, spending a lot of money. So I found a few just quotes and examples off websites, people talking about their addiction. Um, one guy was saying, you know, he'd got to the point where he was struggling to pay medical bills because of his uh, investment in this online game. Somebody else was talking about, you know, a particular game as being their danger game uh, due to the fact that they were having to, you know, getting to the point of incurring overdraft to pay their rent. Um, people will spend, yeah, up to sort of $3,000 or more in single purchases. And as you can see from this player's description, there's often a very similar sort of felt experience in these games um, in terms of all of your... He says, you know, gambling these points on random drops. So you're not, you're not actually gambling on real money. You're gambling for something that only has value in the game, and yet the same kind of rush that players experience is very similar. And once you've spent a little bit of money, it's very, very easy to continue spending more and more. Um, just a few quick facts that I found interesting in the course of my research about uh, sort of the monetization around video games. Um, one of the best performing mobile games, Puzzle and Dragons, makes over five million US dollars per day. So compared to gambling, it might seem relatively small, and yet this is one game out of tens of thousands. Um, the most expensive hat in the first-person shooter, Team Fortress 2, currently costs around $500, although that's fluctuating all the time. It does nothing. And by nothing, I don't mean like it does a little bit. It does nothing. A lot of the things in these games will give you a small benefit or something. This just looks cool, and people will still pay $500 for it. Uh, in the Zynga game Frontierville, there's this part in it where the player's confronted with a wounded, crying baby deer that's been attacked by coyotes, and they're told if they don't pay $5 to cure the deer, it will die. And this is a game that, uh, you know, if you're playing on a device that's been unlocked by your parents or something like that, you know, kids can be having access to this kind of thing. And you've probably seen some of these articles in the news about kids racking up thousands of dollars of, of uh, credit card bills for their parents playing some uh, Smurfs game, which had a very similar kind of, you know, in-app purchases. And the worldwide market for virtual goods was $15 billion in 2012 and has been increasing incredibly rapidly year on year. So just a few statistics around problem gaming. Um, it's been researched in a number of countries, Germany, USA, South Korea. Uh, it's worth noting a lot of the sort of the most cutting edge research around this is coming from South Korea. They're one of the most, um, well they are the most connected country in the world, have the highest rates of use of um, pretty much all kinds of sort of technology around this and have some, they've got to the point with video game addiction where they've passed legislation around it because it has become recognized as a public health problem. Uh, addiction rates seem to be really varied depending on which research you read, anywhere from three to 25% and problematic gaming rates seem to be somewhere around about 10% according to a number of the different studies. Um, However, it's difficult to research as there's no established criteria. There's no DSM diagnosis of internet gaming addiction. So just briefly on that, um, as most of you will be aware, there's no clear consensus anyway regarding behavioral addictions. There's, uh, you know, the disease concepts sort of medical models, the idea that it stems from, you know, uh, I don't know, um, early traumas or deficits from environmental factors. It's a very, very complex picture. And the same is true when it comes to gaming addiction. It has been added, as you may be aware, to the DSM-5 as a condition requiring further research. Um, but I think the really big thing here, and it kind of touches on one of the questions that was asked just before, is that diagnostic tools are by their very nature conservative in a lot of ways, and I think rightfully so, and they receive a lot of criticism for the sort of overinflation, the overmedicalization of a lot of these problems. The DSM-5 came under a lot of criticism for the um, expansion of many different um, disorders and so on. And I think there's a real risk there that you know, everything can become pathologized and seen as an individual problem. At the same time, the rate of technological change is so great that we are unquestionably seeing uh, the impact of this in terms of individual psychology. And we don't know where that's gonna go. We don't know what the implications of that are gonna be yet. And in my private practice as a psychotherapist and since setting up this website, I've been approached by quite a significant number of people who have identified gaming addiction as a primary problem for them. 
and of course different forms of gaming meet different needs. I, I won't go into that in this presentation, but there's some quite interesting research around that too. So perhaps it's best then to conceive of problematic video gaming as a continuum from casual gaming, you know, someone who might log in and just play Angry Birds on their phone once or twice a day, all the way to, well, where I was really, a full-blown gaming addiction. Uh, and in between you've got highly engaged gamers. So some people, you know, play quite a number of hours a day, really enjoy it and have absolutely no problems with it. So you do have that kind of continuum. Symptoms will be very familiar to most of you uh, in terms of similarity to gambling. People think obsessively about it, start to dream about it, lose track of time, become agitated or depressed when their gaming is interrupted. You might have seen, again, news articles of people going as far as like stabbing other people or assaulting their parents because the Xbox was taken away. Uh, the development of tolerance, needing to play for longer. And this is a big one, of course, people start to use gaming as a coping strategy, and if it becomes their primary coping strategy, that can become really problematic. And then there's a whole element of, you know, reduced behavioural control. People, and I was certainly in this category, I got to the point where I, I wasn't enjoying gaming anymore, uh, but it was absolutely compulsive. I don't know what else to do with my time, and it became, yeah, very much a coping strategy. And at the extreme end of this, you know, we've seen a few small number of incidents of people, you know, dying, uh, one young guy in South Korea died after like a 72 hour gaming session from a cardiac arrest at age 23 or something, I can't remember. A number of people have like neglected their children to the point that their children have died because of their gaming addictions. So at the extreme end it can be quite serious. So obviously there's similarities there between gaming and gambling. Uh, players experience a very similar sort of rush or sense of flow while playing, a sense of sort of potency and satisfaction from winning the compulsive desire to continue, the sort of just one more turn, just one more game, and real life starts to seem dull and uninteresting compared to the game, and that's because of you know, the very sort of immediate rewards and feedback that the game provides. And there's some differences, of course, as well. A lot of these games place a very strong emphasis on the social environment that they create. Um, often they require the cooperation of multiple players to achieve goals in the game. And so there's often a sense created of being needed or important or potent or whatever, and that can be pretty compelling for people who haven't experienced that a whole lot before. Um, at the moment, generally speaking, games are not seen as socially harmful um, and may even be encouraged in some situations as a coping mechanism. I worked for a very brief period in a, a um, family violence organisation, and with some of the young kids who are coming in with anger and violence problems, it was quite a common intervention suggested to manage that. And that you know, can be a useful outlet, but when it becomes their only way of sort of coping with those uh, really difficult feelings, I think that's potentially a recipe for disaster. Uh, there's persistence in these games. games. Gamers' progress carries over from one session to the next, and like with the character I was talking about before, by the time I played 2,000 hours, there's a real reluctance to um, leave that behind because there's a sense that I was losing something that I'd, you know, worked pretty hard at. And of course, you know, most of these games are not designed to offer for players any chance of recouping their money. So unlike the regulated gambling industry where there's sort of certain payout rates and all this kind of thing, in games there's no expectation that players get their money back. So now on to sort of the crux of this really. There's been quite a change in the economic models underpinning games. Uh, games originally sort of started off as a good. They're just one-off purchases. You go to the shop in New Zealand, it might cost you like 100 bucks for a game and you can play it as much as you want. Uh, then games started to become offered as a service, often using subscription models. You'd pay a certain fee, $15 a month or whatever, and you could play for as long as you wanted. Then they became offered as a modular good. Um, games were offered you like buy an initial product, and then there was additional kind of add-ons that you could buy for the game, and what often called downloadable content, or games were released as a series of episodes, much like TV series. And then most recently, games have started being offered in a way that I've sort of conceptualised as being a gateway to a service. This is the free-to-play or freemium games. So the game itself is free and very easy to download onto your phone, and the monetization comes through the use of in-app purchases or microtransactions. So these are often, well, they can be quite expensive, but very often they're 2 or $3 at a time, but the players are encouraged to make them over and over and over again in order to make progress in the game. So, um, I think uh, Professor Goethe touched on this as well, which mobile games earn the most? Well, if you look on the iTunes store or the Google Play store, out of the top 200 or so highest earning games, the vast, vast, vast majority of them are free. So how does that work? Well, games are free to play and they rely on player skill up to a point. And this is part of the, um, 
what makes these games quite attractive is that they're often quite well designed, that they're quite a challenge, and players can feel quite good about themselves getting better and better at the game and think, oh yeah, I'm getting the hang of this, awesome. At a certain point, though, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to progress without spending real money, and a game econo economist uh, referred to this as the game becoming a money game rather than a skill game. And in, in the most successful of these, this transition's often quite subtle, and so players feel like, uh, you know, I should be able to get past this point if I was just a little bit of a better player, but it's only $2, you know, that's not a big deal, I'll just pay and I, then I can keep going again. Uh, and the players are persuaded to spend money in a variety of ways that exploit uh, what we sort of know about players and human psychology. So that's where I'm coming onto with this, this idea of coercive monetization. Um, so coercive monetization is any process which is essentially using psychological tricks to persuade the player to spend money, either by hiding information or pr more commonly providing it in such a way that the player doesn't really take it in fully. Um, this guy is well worth reading, Raman Chakrasad. He's a, a game economist and writes quite extensively about monetization of these kind of games. And it's, I think he's got a lot of insight as well into how um, this will be used in terms of mobile gambling as well. So just a few of the ways in which this happens. Um, very, very similar to how like a casino uses chips. All these games, you tend not to spend like real money directly for items in the game. Instead, you buy in-game currency. So coins or stars or gems or whatever. And then you use that currency to buy items in the game. And what this does is it distances the player somewhat from the sense of how much money they're spending. And there's plenty of research that shows that that's a very effective way to get people to spend more money. There's a sense of urgency. Uh, so, and this is something again that was touched on this morning, you have these what are called push notifications. These get sent to your phone even when you're not in the game. So you get a message saying, you know, hurry, there's a sale on for two hours only, 80% off, come buy, you know, whatever it is. Uh, and of course that's quite compelling as well, so players get the sense that they're being um, you know, offered really good deals. And an interesting thing about this that's quite different from gambling is because the stuff in the game has no intrinsic value, they can offer what appear to be like quite ridiculous discounts. So you see this you know, 80% off, 90% off, this is pretty common um, because they're not actually offering you anything that's worth anything. So it's only 80% off in some really abstract kind of sense. Um, as again, they'll tend to reward you every time you log in. And so if every single day that you log into the game, you get a reward for doing so. And they tend to have it so that um, the more days in a row that you log in, the better the reward that you get. And if you miss a day, you go back to you know, day one and have to start all over again. So this is really, really compelling as well. And as we know, people are quite uh, averse to loss. So they feel like they've logged in four days in a row. It's like, oh, I can't miss day five because then I'm going to have to start all over again. So this is one of the major mechanics in these games, and so I want to sort of spend a little bit longer on this one. Um, I've taken this example from uh, the game Puzzle and Dragons I mentioned earlier, and this is what's called a progress gate. So um, t in this game, you control a little, a little party of heroes that are trying to go through a dungeon and kill progressively tougher series of monsters. So this is one of your little hero guys, and the way the game works is you go into the dungeon, you come across a monster, and there's a little bit of skill involved, but it's quite easy. And you beat that, and you get some coins or points or whatever. And you carry on, and you come across another one, and it's a little tougher, but you're fine. You beat that, you get some more points. And after a certain point, you get to a stage where you really try, but you, you, you lose. And what the games do at this point very commonly, which is quite clever, is um, they say, well, you know, you've made all this progress. You don't want to lose all that progress you've made. So, you know, for a small amount of money, you can just carry on and, yeah, basically continue on in the game. And the first time you come across one of these what are called progress gates where you have to spend some money, it, it might be quite a long way into the game. You might have been able to play for you know, a number of hours or even days having a lot of fun with this game before you reach this point. If you do pay the money to carry on, you'll be able to get on, go, continue on for quite a bit further. Um, and then you'll hit another progress gate where you'll have to pay money again to continue and it'll be slightly sooner. You do it again, it'll get sooner and sooner and sooner. So these get closer and closer together, so you become acclimatized to the idea of having to pay money to make progress in the game. Uh, and then the second aspect that these games use really well is what I've referred to as non-monetary gambling. So 
this is essentially you're paying real money, but what you're getting is something that's not doesn't have any real value. So again, in this game, Puzzle and Dragons, your little team of heroes, they can have like different strengths. If you think of like Lord of the Rings or something, they can range from being, you, I don't know, your average footman, foot soldier or something, all the way up to really powerful heroes like Gandalf or Legolas or whatever. Um, but you don't get to buy those directly. You, you get to buy a chance at getting one of the stronger heroes. And it actually even looks like a slot machine. Well, kind of, it's a dragon, but with a little handle that you pull. So you put your money in, a little egg pops out, it's flashing lights and sound and all of that, and you get some kind of hero. And more often than not, it's something pretty crappy that's not really going to help you very much. So you want to try again and put some more money in and get a different one. And you know, if you put enough money in, you know that the chances are good you'll eventually get something kind of cool. So this really plays on the kind of variable reward ratios, you know, what we know about people's uh, being motivated by this kind of um, yeah, psychological tricks. So it is, you know, for pretty much all intents and purposes, it is gambling. It's just that what you're getting isn't worth anything except, uh, you know, the player, I suppose. So how does that link through to gambling then? Well, there's been quite a bit of research around this. Some of you might be familiar with um, Mark Griffiths over in the UK. He's done a lot of research both around gambling, but also around this kind of social and mobile gaming. It familiarizes and makes players comfortable with the concept of in-game spending. Uh, they use the same kind of variable reward ratios and non-monetary gambling to incentivize risk-taking. There's a whole range of these sort of psychological tricks that are used to lead players to spend. Um, and just sort of lastly to finish off, um, in the work with problem gamers, and I've done quite a bit of research, this has been the sort of the focus of my master's research, a few things that have really come up, and it's probably not that surprising, but because I'm aware that you know, some of the agencies are starting to be approached by people with video gaming problems, a couple of the sort of the things that have been really important in this is um, respecting the player's experience. A lot of the time I've found people have come, in, come to me sort of looking for help and said, oh yep, yeah. uh, you know, I, they didn't expect to be taken seriously. They expect that people would try and say, you know, oh, that can't be your problem, must be something else. So it's been quite crucial, uh, I think, in this working with these, this client group to listen to and respect the experience that they describe. And of course, along with that means learning from the client. Um, and then the biggest part, because uh, a lot of us might not be familiar with all of the sort of intricacies of these games, Understanding their patterns in detail, when, why, how do they game, what games, what do they think, feel, do, etc. Um, and it's because, as I said before, these games often fill quite different psychological needs. And I've found that with the different clients I've worked with, there's been often a very, well, not very different, but somewhat different uh, primary motivating force behind that. Um, and then the usual kind of things in terms of addressing underlying thoughts, feelings, and developing new coping strategies and alternatives. So, yeah, just to conclude, there's no uh, sort of clear diagnostic criteria around gaming addiction at the moment, but it is increasingly being recognised as a problem here and overseas. And if we look at places like Korea that are, you know, seem to be a few steps ahead of the rest of the world in terms of their rate of technology uptake, it seems like this is only likely to become, uh, you know, an even larger problem as time goes on. Problematic and addictive gaming primarily seems to arise when it's meeting needs that are not otherwise being met. And I think this change in business models behind video games is leading to the use of very similar psychological tactics to what's been seen in gambling games. And indeed, many of the companies that have started out making mobile and social uh, video games have started shifting their business to include the use of monetary gambling games. So there really is quite a real convergence of um, the business models here. And the consequences, of course, is that the exploitation of a minority of addicted players is leading to significant detrimental effects for those players. So I'll finish there. And I, do we have any time for questions? Yeah, thank you very much. Great. Oh, sorry. It changes all the time. It's the same basic structure, but I paid to get a, a chest full of gems, which meant that I could get that upgrade a little bit earlier than something else. And mm -hmm. uh, what I'm really aware of is I've got money. I was once addicted to pokies, and I've just realised I've just moved on to the next best thing without being even aware of that, and that disturbs me. Mm -hmm. um, what really disturbs me is I have children in my community that live in this world. They don't have money yet because mm -hmm. they're still kids. 
So they're being groomed and conditioned um, to, to, to live into this next world. Uh, we have a thing called Gigatown going on in our country at the moment. I live in Masterton and you know, we've got this big push for bringing in um, the first town in the world to basically have the fastest internet. Mm-hmm. This is great, let's bring this to our town that's going to raise our economy. It is also opening the floodgates to a lot of danger. I was texting my little brother last night, he's in South Korea, it's funny you mention mm. that. And I got quite into like LOL and I even, I watched the um, eSports. Yes, I love it. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I love it. And then he's cracking up, he goes, bro, watch this. Sends a Snapchat and they have it on their mainstream TVs. Mm-hmm. You know, while he's downloading, I shouldn't say this, it's probably a bit, what, seven movies simultaneously. Whereas here, like you download one, wait for an hour and then, <laughs> so they have, you know, as you said, they are us in maybe months. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And so I have a first cousin that lost his job, um, lost everything in Australia, nearly lost his family. Um, to um, wow. Yeah, yeah. And he got to the point where he was um, the strongest character in Australasia. Mm-hmm. And that's you have to lose your job and your family nearly to get to that point. And you know as well. So yeah, I have to know. Yeah. This is, so, this is, uh, you're, you're in a great forum to have this conversation, and there are some, obviously some good people here with some great ideas. We're aware of what's about to hit our country and open up, um, you know, high-speed broadband, and everyone's praising this thing, mm-hmm. without realising it comes with the, laced with, um, I like what the guy said yesterday, um, better than sex, crack cocaine, mm-hmm. and this is just the evolved version. Um, thank you for your talk. It is relevant and important that this quarter was carried on, and I think mm. this is a group of people that need to be involved in these next steps. So that's awesome. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Have we have a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Nick Anderson from Problem Gambling Foundation, and I've played a fair few video games in my time as well. Uh, can you talk about? what differences there might be in terms of, I guess, the, the prevalence of, of addiction between people who play games like Candy Crush, where you're just one person focused on beating the next level, versus the more social games like your own experience with EverQuest and World of Warcraft, where you have a group of people, maybe a group of friends that you've never met in real life, but friends who you are nevertheless feel an attachment to, mm-hmm. and are, are regularly uh, playing in that sort of m- more social setting. Yeah, that's a really big question, and as you may be aware, uh, what, um, research around video game addiction started in response to players who were becoming you know, very addicted to those kind of uh, massively multiplayer games like Warcraft and EverQuest. Um, I think it's too early really to see what the difference will be in terms of you know, long-term trends and problematic use. Anecdotally, from my own experience, those massively multiplayer games still have a number of elements to them that um, encourage much more sort of addictive and long-term patterns of use you know for a minority of players which is I think often around that sense of social inclusion of belonging of persistence what that games like Candy Crush and so on don't necessarily have to the same degree thank you very much James appreciate it James will be around I'm assuming oh, well, yes. for more questions over over lunch I'm sorry we need to close up now to give the next speaker there Absolutely. a very amount of time thank you very much thank you